you so much for for having me and thank you to to all of you here here joining a webinar instead of watching uh, another episode on netflix or whatever else you'd be doing in, in the covid 19 era i will try to keep my presentation uh short so we have more time for questions and please post your questions as you go and I'll, I'll try to sort of keep track of what's going on, but likely we won't really get to most of them until, until the end. All right, so this paper is, is co-authored with Mark Paul, he's actually the lead author, and, and Josh Mason, who are both uh, economists as well. So it's very much from an economic perspective, uh, but we're trying to think through what it'll be like uh, to decarbonize the US economy through something like a Green New Deal. So I will start by telling you things that you already know. Um, we have a serious climate crisis. If we want to minimize the chance of, of warming exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius or two degrees Celsius, or for that matter, three degrees Celsius, we need to rapidly reduce emissions. So this figure is showing you to, to keep, um, to keep um, warming down below 1.5 degrees Celsius, an admittedly ambitious goal, Right, we need to bring emissions down to zero by, by 2040 globally. The, the second crisis that I think a Green New Deal needs to grapple with is the inequality crisis. And in fact, these two crises are sort of interlinked. Right, We've seen efforts to reduce carbon emissions with the uh, carbon tax or gasoline tax in France with sort of strong populist opposition on the grounds of fairness. Right, that sure, rich people can afford to pay more for a gallon of gasoline, but poor folks can't necessarily. So a Green New Deal is attempting to provide a solution to both these things simultaneously. Right, provide both an economically and socially and environmentally sustainable way forward. And if you haven't had a chance to watch uh, this video narrated by AOC, I encourage you to. Uh, maybe I can post my slides later in a way that you can just follow the link, or if you if you Google a message from the future, I suppose it'll be the first thing that shows up. So I think it's important for us to recognize the popularity of a Green New Deal, especially for those of us, and it's probably the vast majority of us here are already sort of on board with doing what we can to reduce emissions about as quickly as possible. Um, but a Green New Deal is much more popular than, than other sort of environmental policies. So it's about as popular as providing a pathway to citizenship for immigrants in the United States or legalizing cannabis, both fairly popular policies. And it's much more popular than, for example, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement or adopting a carbon tax. So that might not be a very informed sort of perspective of the American public, but that is sort of a perspective. People do seem to support a sort of radical effort to remake the economy among a lot more sustainable and egalitarian lines. Nevertheless, I think a Green New Deal remains kind of poorly defined. We don't know exactly what it would mean. We know sort of what the goals are, but we don't know exactly how to build it up. And this paper and this talk are an attempt to provide a framework for a Green New Deal. So we propose three pillars for ambitious climate policy. We propose to build a Green New Deal around a carbon dividend, around new regulations, and I'll focus here today on carbon neutral building codes in an electrical vehicles mandate and on public investment. And I'll focus on this talk on expanding mass transit and building a high capacity national grid. If you go on to our paper, uh, we also discuss retrofitting, paying farmers, um, federal research and development, directing credit to green businesses and so on. Our argument here is that carbon dividends, regulation, and public investments are best thought of as complements, not substitutes. So we sort of, you can kind of think of it as we need all policies on deck to sort of transform our economy and society going forward. And our big point is that a Green New Deal would be less expensive than not having a Green New Deal. It's less expensive than inaction. So I want to start with sort of the case for the carbon dividend and with the Econ 101 of carbon pricing. So if you imagine demand for carbon emissions, right, as sort of a cheap way of providing energy, right, we have some sort of downward sloping demand curve for those emissions. So that when there's no cost of putting carbon in the atmosphere, which is roughly what we have today in the United States, right, we have 6 billion tons of CO2 that are emitted every year. And as we raise the costs, 
right? We would reduce the amount of emissions. We don't really know exactly what numbers should be up here on the vertical axis, right? This is a very simplistic linear line. We only understand, right? The best we understand is sort of this part of the curve right down here in the lower right-hand um, corner. Chris, by the way, can you see my cursor when I when I point to things? Yep, you can see it flying around. Perfect. All right, so this part of the demand curve is what we understand the best, right? Um, what we know or think we know is that if we, for example, put in impose a tax of fifteen dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, that that would reduce emissions by a bit, but not very much, maybe to five point nine um, billion tons of CO two. Right, that would be equivalent to $100 per ton of CO2 is about $1 per gallon of gasoline. So you can think of a $15 tax per ton of CO2 as being roughly 15 cents per gallon. And perhaps, right, unsurprisingly, then a $15 tax or a 15 cent tax on gasoline uh, isn't going to have too much effect in how much you drive around and so on. So what's important to recognize is if we are going to put a price on carbon, we need to put a pretty high price on carbon. We propose uh, a price starting at $230 per ton, which would be about $2.30 per gallon of gasoline. We think in the short run that would reduce emissions by about a quarter. We don't know this perfectly. It's by comparing the United States to, to other countries and so on that have, that have more taxes on, on fossil fuels. But the important thing we understand here is on the one hand, a tax of $230 per ton is going to impose some costs on households and businesses as we find other ways of doing things that don't rely on fossil fuel energy. Right? This simple arithmetic suggests that would be in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year. But even more importantly, there's going to be a huge amount of money. Right? We're going to continue to emit something like 4.5 billion tons of CO2 at that price. 4.5 billion tons of CO2 times three, $230 per ton is something like a trillion dollars uh, a tax revenue that would be raised by putting a price on carbon. And so a big part of the conversation around carbon pricing is not just about how high should the price be. Most of us probably think as high as we could pass, right? But also what are we gonna do with something like a trillion dollars potentially of federal revenue? Right? And so the logic of carbon dividends is that we impose a carbon tax upstream and then extractors and importers pass these costs onto consumers downstream and so that the prices of goods will increase in proportion to the carbon intensity. In our model, by uh, Mark Paul and, and me, right, we see that uh, increasing the cost of, of carbon by $230 per ton would increase the price of education by about 5%. Not too much because education does not require very much fossil fuels, some lighting and technology and so on, but not too much, right? It would increase the cost of groceries about 9%, Airfare would go up 23%, electricity 51%, gasoline 79%, right? So the price of goods would then reflect sort of their social cost, their environmental cost. And then the logic of a carbon dividend is once, right, on the one hand, those price changes are gonna incentivize firms and households and government to shift spending towards low carbon alternatives, right? biking more, uh, putting solar panels on your home and so on. But then those increase in costs, we can use to fund a dividend that we get back to people. Um, $230 per ton would fund a dividend of approximately $2,200 per person per year in the United States. Right? So all of these results are from another paper that you could look up if you're interested um, for People of Policy Project that sort of does or explains some of this modeling. One reason to use carbon, carbon revenues for a dividend is to understand that carbon taxes are regressive. So the rich pollute much more than the poor. So in dollar terms, the rich pollute about five or six times the rich, the top 10% of Americans, the richest 10%, pollute five or six times as much as the poorest 10%. But as a percent of their income, right? So the rich will pay more in taxes in dollar terms, but they're gonna pay less as a percent of their income. So the, the lighter lines here, show you what roughly the tax burden would be by decile as a fraction of income here on the right axis, right? So carbon taxes are regressive because poor households spend a higher share of their income on carbon intensive goods like gasoline and electricity and so on. So the solution is to rebate carbon tax revenues and equal dividends. 
right? A tax of $230 funds a dividend of 2,200 bucks or so. And the average person in the poorest decile then would get that 220 bucks. They would then pay something like, oh, is that pop up next? Oh, sorry. They get the 2,200 bucks. Then they're going to pay something like $800 in higher costs, which is going to leave them about $1,400. The green here shows you how much they come out ahead after paying the higher costs for, for energy and groceries and everything. Meanwhile, the richest, someone in the richest DESA would still get the 2,200 bucks, but their costs are so great that they would still come out about 2,500 bucks in the red because they, you know, they fly so much, um, own bigger cars and so on. So here in this figure, the, the green benefits, right, for folks in the bottom six deciles on average exactly add up to the red costs of those in the richest four deciles. And that's sort of necessarily the case, right? You can't make sort of everyone, everyone have more dollars in the pocket. Um, but the point is a dividend makes the policy relatively progressive. Um, increasingly, economists are supporting this as, as a way forward. Um, I have some quotes here that I think you can go through on your own if you want. But the point is thousands of economists have now signed on to this idea. And I think this is important because economists have long supported carbon pricing as sort of a panacea to deal with climate change. But now we're also starting to think in economics about what the distributional sort of impact looks like. And, and that's what's leading in support using the money to give it back to people in, in lump sum payments, similar to a sort of UBI. Uh, if you're interested in that movement, the Citizens Climate Lobby is, of course, one of the prominent uh, supporters of it. It's worth noting that the, the carbon fee that we're envisioning in the, in the previous slides is $230 per ton, much higher than what CCL's bill has been pushing for right now. I think it's about $15 per ton. Um, so, you know, we can argue about exactly how high the price can be and so on. But we think by providing folks with a dividend, that's actually going to make it easier to raise the price on carbon over time. Uh, you can also go use their calculator on, on the website and calculate out. I think I found out my household doesn't come out ahead too much because we spend quite a bit of money. But um, the calculator suggests we'd be $10 a month better off. And if the, if the, if the price on carbon were raised tenfold, of course, then we'd be $100 better off per month and so on. Okay, so that's that's our first case that we should put a price on carbon, which is the sort of thing economists have been saying for for decade, although admittedly usually a very small price is what they've actually been supporting. The second component we think of a green new deal is just regulations. The government just saying that certain forms of, of pollution are no longer acceptable, right? And here it's important to recognize in the idealized world of economic models, pricing carbon is sort of the perfect solution that aligns self-interest with the public good. But in the actual economy, right, it's characterized by all sorts of what economists call imperfections, right? stuff like bounded rationality. People don't perfectly respond to an increase in gas prices and think about, mm, maybe I should move closer to where I work, or maybe I should buy a more fuel-efficient car, or an electric car, or bike more, and so on. Right? People don't, they're not the sort of human calculators economists often assume. There's also asymmetric information where you actually, as a consumer, you often don't even know what the cost is going to be to operate an appliance or, or own a home or, or, and so on. Um, and in fact, the people selling you goods tend to have more information and kind of lie to you about how, how cheap they're going to be to run over time. And that's another reason to just regulate the folks selling these goods rather than just try to provide an incentive for consumers to, to do the right thing. And there are also economies of scale where it's often cheaper for us all to do something that reduces carbon emissions rather than to just price carbon and let people decide one by one what they want to do. Right? That's also sort of a coordination problem. So we argue that regulations can be cheaper and more effective than carbon pricing. Our, our case is sort of rested on, on the historical example of technology mandates. For example, catalytic converters. Right? In 1975, the EPA required new cars to be equipped with catalytic converters. Right? They could have, of course, put a price on carbon monoxide emissions and somehow enforced it in a way that we provide individual consumers an incentive to perhaps install a catalytic converter on their cars. Of course, it's much cheaper to just decide all cars have to have them and just install them all of them regularly. Uh, the corporate average fuel economy provides another sort of example. Um, 
right, increases in gas prices, actually it doesn't look like an increase in gas prices has that too much effect on the sort of cars that people buy. It has some, but it doesn't look like people fully recognize the savings over time. And so there's some case for just regulating the fuel efficiency of cars separately. So the two main regulations that we think should be part of a Green New Deal are carbon neutral building codes and then uh, an electric vehicle mandate. So on the building codes, buildings account for almost 40% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. But we also have strong evidence that investments in energy efficiency pay off over the long run. Right? We see this in studies of LEED and Energy Star certified buildings following the actual consumption of fossil fuels over time. Uh, we also see that voluntary certification with these sorts of programs increases the rent of uh, buildings that are being rented out to folks. Nevertheless, builders and landlords underinvest in energy efficiency. So we suggest right, mandating that by 2025, new buildings should meet high energy efficiency standards, which we sort of recognize have to differ a little bit locality to locality. So there'd be a job for cities and states to figure out what that means. In, in their particular location, rely entirely on electric power. Right? This is going to be a huge change, but at some point we need to stop building fossil fuel energy uh, to new developments and be accessible by green transportation, which of course a lot of the dirtiness of buildings is not just a fuel that they, that they consume themselves, but how far spread out they are from the other buildings that people need to be able to transport themselves to. Um, California is probably leading the way in a bunch of, of these standards. All new homes this year need to have rooftop solar in California, although importantly, they do not yet need to be entirely electric. Uh, developers fought very hard against that sort of regulation because, of course, at current prices, it's more expensive to run an all-electric home than a home with natural gas, um, although, of course, current prices don't reflect the true cost of climate change. A second regulation that we think would be very useful is an electric vehicles mandate. So transportation accounts for 28% of emissions. And again, investments in EVs are gonna pay off over the long run. They're simpler to maintain. Uh, the average vehicle also runs for 11 years, so we need to make this transition very quickly. Um, buyers are currently under investing upfront. So this is what I was saying before, right? If the price of gasoline, even if consumers know the price of gasoline is high, are going to go up in the future as we address climate change and so on. They often are not willing to spend $1,000 today to invest in a more efficient car that will save them you know, thousands of dollars over the next 11 years. This is part of the reason that electric vehicle statutes are spreading. In California, they're going to require 8% EVs by 2025, 8% of new cars to be EVs. Some other places in the world are much more ambitiously seeking 100% of EVs. So Norway wants 100% EVs by 2025. Although it's important to note, Norway is not doing this simply through an electric vehicles mandate. Uh, the federal government, we think, should adopt an EV mandate that increases EVs market share over time in the same way that we regulated the fuel economy over time. We think it'd be reasonable to have 100% EVs by 2030, simply through a mandate. And so, both producers and consumers know that this is where we're heading and act accordingly. Okay, the final pillar in our Green New Deal is, is public investment. And this is probably what most people so, sort of associate with the policies of a Green New Deal. And so I guess we put it last because we really think that regulation and carbon pricing have an important role to play. So public spending is gonna be necessary for public alternatives to a carbon intensive economy, right? Again, often there are economies of scale here, right? Or coordination problems that can only be solved by the government stepping in and providing a low carbon or zero carbon alternative to current what, what are currently carbon intensive goods. Um, the examples here, right, we're gonna use is our, our mass transit and uh, high capacity national grid. So, Public investment can be financed in part through things like a financial transactions tax, for example, 0.5% in every transaction um, on Wall Street when you're buying and selling stock. It's sort of the nice thing about financial transactions tax is it not only raises revenue, but could potentially also reduce volatility in financial markets. A wealth tax, um, 
we suggested two to three percent um, on wealth over ten million dollars a year. Although the Bernie Sanders campaign, for example, suggested uh, even a higher wealth tax on very high incomes, um, progressive income taxes. But we think it's important to also recognize that today there's a strong case for deficit spending. So even before COVID-19, which is of course when we wrote this this paper, macroeconomic conditions were good for deficit spending. And what do I mean by that? Well. Unemployment was below 4%, right? But labor force participation was still about 2% lower, uh, you know, two months ago uh, than, it, than it was before the last crisis, before the Great Recession. Oh, sorry, sorry. Before the, the, the collapse after the um, dot-com boom and just about before the Great Recession as well. Wages were relatively stagnant and inflation was far below target. Right? The output gap in the United States is something like 10% of GDP uh, since, since the Great Recession. So here, right, the, the darker line is showing you what GDP actually did over time. And the lighter line is showing you the trend we were following up until 2008. And where now we have GDP that's roughly 10% lower than what we thought it would have been uh, in summer 2008, for example. Uh, after COVID-19, right, a Green New Deal could be even more important. So I think if anything, the macroeconomic case has gotten even stronger, right? That it makes sense for the government to borrow some money and invest in transitioning the economy to green energy. Uh, one sort of exercise we work through uh, is this, where we see what would happen if we just continue on our current government deficit uh, path. And by current, this paper is from, from last year. So it's it's slightly updated now. But if we had increased our deficit by 4% a year uh, for 10 years, then our debt would have gone up for a while and then declined slowly again um, because of economic growth and the low interest rates we're paying on debt. Um, if you believe that there's some slack in the economy, the real increase in the debt to GDP ratio would be lower. Um, this is what we're trying to show here in the deficit with hysteresis. Hysteresis um, is the idea that when you when demand is artificially low, or when demand is low for, for a number of years, right, that actually can prevent the economy from returning to where it was before. People, for example, fall out of the labor force and then don't rapidly come back in even when unemployment falls, for example. So if hysteresis is a problem, deficit, there's even a stronger case for deficit spending, um, and it'll have a smaller impact on the debt to GDP ratio, right, because over time, um, the economy will actually grow and stay bigger than it would otherwise have been. Right, so this is what I just said, but the, the baseline under business as usual is the bottom curve here. Um, 10 years of spending without any hysteresis would take up the debt to GDP ratio you know, above 110%, um, but that's not particularly worrisome. It's important to remember Japan is at over 200% of GDP. Um, and then if you think that there's some macroeconomic weakness, then it's going to be somewhere in between those two cases. So what would we do with public funding? Well, the thing is, there are some paths towards decarbonizing the economy that strongly rely on government support, right? So expanding mass transit is going to have to be something that's funded by the government. It's not going to be done purely individually, right? Today, our car-based transportation system generates about 28% of emissions. Uh, it also costs government about $200 billion a year to, to build and maintain our roads. And it costs households about $1.1 trillion to purchase and maintain their private vehicles. So it's not like, we often think it's sort of, you know, that, that private transportation is cheap, but it's not cheap. It costs households an enormous amount of money, right? This is about 5% of GDP. Um, it also leaves vehicles idle about 96% of the time. So we're massively investing and this infrastructure that we use only 4% of the time, these, these physical cars and so on. And of course, it causes congestion and deaths and, and so on. So right, our, our current cities, you know, our streets are built mostly to serve cars. Uh, cars don't move around very many people in a given amount of space. So mass transit moves a lot of people. Walking and biking actually move more people in a certain amount of space than cars do. So what we'd like to do is expand these things, right? Get more transit, walking, and biking. Mass transit plus electric vehicles plus ride sharing plus more active transit 
would both reduce emissions by 80%, according to a study by, in UC Davis, and cost less than business as usual. Right? So it's important for us to recognize it would cost the government more money to provide this with mass transit rather than, than just roads, uh, but it would cost us as individuals potentially much less money. Right? So public investments, we think, should be used to first replace the $18 billion in fares that people currently pay to take mass transit. It's sort of, it doesn't make a lot of sense to charge people to ride mass transit when there is actually a huge cost of people moving themselves around on their cars. We'd like to electrify our existing systems. In general, electrifying buses and trains and so on is going to be cheaper than electrifying private vehicles. And we should expand capacity and establish new systems. I mean, in Fort Collins, for example, you know, we have a mass transit system, but it's not particularly well developed. And part of that is because there are still fares, right? I think I, I forget exactly the numbers. And you may know the situation well in, in Boulder or Denver, but fares in Fort Collins cover a small fraction of the cost of running our mass transit, but we continue to collect them, which is a little weird since a lot of the buses are not particularly full. And since it costs money, of course, for us to, to collect fares, make sure only the right people are on the bus and so on. Um, what we want to do is make decarbonized transit the first best option for most transportation. It's not that we need to get rid of all cars and so on, but we want it to be convenient enough that people are usually using decarbonized transit um, or active transit instead of moving around in automobiles. And a final piece where government investment is clearly needed is, is building a high capacity national grid. So the electricity sector generates 28% of emissions. And really, 100% renewable electricity is relatively low hanging fruit. Right? That's going to be easier for us to do than, than electrifying the heating of, of homes like mine that still rely on natural gas. So a carbon price or renewable portfolio standards can work to help electrify uh, the, the grid. Um, but there, there, there are problems there too, where really uh, often the cheapest way for us to electrify the grid is going to be able to move electricity around uh, to take advantage of the fact that sunrise and sunset um, are four hours apart across the United States and that wind patterns are negatively correlated across space. So when it's windy one place, it means it's generally not windy in the next, right? So a high capacity national grid would help us move the electricity around better. It would help us deal with problems like the, the so-called duck curve in California, where in the middle of a sunny day in California now, um, the, the solar energy they have installed is bringing the megawatts they need of other electricity you know, down far enough that's starting to get costly, where essentially it'd be nice to be able to move some of that solar energy to other states. An $80 billion high capacity national grid would link our separate grids in this country. It would reduce the need for storage, which is more expensive than being able to move electricity in real time. And according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, it would pay for itself even when you assume a very low price on carbon. I think their study is looking at a price in uh, around $20 per ton or 20 cents per gallon of gas. Um, but of course, it's exactly the sort of thing that requires central funding, federal funding to get it done. Individual utility companies are not going to make this sort of investment. So in conclusion, right, averting catastrophic climate change requires rapid decarbonization. And we propose a framework for a Green New Deal built on carbon dividends regulation, and public investment. We think that that can provide a framework for working through a future that is both sustainable uh, environmentally, but also socially and economically. So the case for Green New Deal is particularly strong now and particularly strong as we sort of hopefully get through, pass through, and, and resolve sort of the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis, right? As we get people back to work, uh, doing some of the most important work of our generation uh, to, to address the, the problem of climate change. So with that, I'm very happy to take your questions. Um, thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Anders. Um, thank you. All right. Get going with questions. Um, give me one second. Alrighty. The first question comes from Reed Crossley. Uh, 
uh, who says, can you speak to the Green New Deal versus the recent calls um, for a Blue New Deal that takes the oceans into more consideration? Are these mutually exclusive paths? Can they be complementary? And is pursuing one limiting efforts of the other? Well, I don't know. I haven't heard about the Blue New Deal, so um, I can't speak very intelligently to it. But I don't think I don't. I think they could be complementary. I, I mean, I'll, really, the only area where we need to worry, I think, about about these sorts of efforts getting away from one another is is to the extent that they require the same sort of productive capacity of the economy. That's the real constraint for doing any of this stuff, right? We only have so many workers, so many capital goods and so on. So I don't know exactly what sort of investments are required for a Blue New Deal, uh, but I suspect they're different from the resources we need to do the much of the work I'm, I'm suggesting here, right? Build up mass transit systems, um, um, a high capacity national grid, um, electrify homes and so on. So no, I, I, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, although I would need to learn more about um, what exactly a Blue New Deal entails. Good question. All righty. The uh, next one is from Evan Allison. Um, are there are there other real world or similar tax dividend tax slash dividend structures being successful, both in reducing the tax activity and appro and appropriately not passing the cost onto the most vulnerable population? So here, what I'd say is is well, okay. In the case in I'd, I'd say yes. <laughs> so what, what's important to recognize though from for so the Econ 101 is that you do want to pass the price on to everyone, right? You want both the rich and poor people to see that actually a gallon of gasoline is five bucks, not two, right? Uh, what, what you're doing with the dividend is you're just making sure that that doesn't have dramatically different effects on people who are rich and poor because they have different incomes. So you're just essentially you're supplementing everyone's income by 2,200 bucks a year. If you do that, right, give everyone 2,200 bucks a year, but make gasoline cost an extra $2.30 a gallon and other prices also go up sort of consistently with that, you're providing everyone with exactly the same incentive to, to not burn the additional gallon of gas, but you're also protecting the incomes of the most vulnerable. So do we have examples of the government having done this? Well, on in terms of pricing pollution, we do. So the um, sulfur dioxide emissions in the United States are regulated essentially in this way uh, for power plants, right? And that's it's one of the ways that we've brought down uh, sulfur dioxide emissions dramatically more cheaply than 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 folks thought it would be um, when these sorts of pricing were first first instituted um, in terms of the climate crisis there are fewer examples that i think convince people often but that's usually because the price that they put on carbon is very very low um, so you know if you're going to tax emissions at 15 or 20 or 25 or even 50 dollars a ton you are going to reduce you know, emissions a bit, but you're not going to reduce them by very much. You have to think that's raising the cost of gasoline by 15, 20, 25 cents, even 50 cents a gallon isn't going to dramatically change how much anyone drives. Um, so I understand that people are sort of skeptical of whether or not uh, this can work, but but if you look, for example, at the difference in emissions across the United States and Europe, some European countries now have carbon prices. Um, but they don't have very high carbon prices in general. And like the European carbon price is still so low, you wouldn't expect much of an impact yet. Um, but they do, a lot of European countries have significant fuel taxes. And so if you think about what level of, of carbon tax it is, they're very high, right? So if you buy a gallon of gasoline in most of Europe, you're paying an extra two, three, four dollars a gallon. Um, and in fact, Europeans drive dramatically less than we do in the United States. So I think there's strong evidence. In fact, people do respond to the price of goods, um, but we do need a high price. And so anytime that you hear a case for, for carbon pricing, the, the first thing we should be thinking about is what level price are we talking about? Because we need a high one to do anything of significance. Um, I'm working with some political scientists right now um, to, to study you know, public support for car carbon pricing, particularly with a dividend. And one of the places we studied was in, in Switzerland which now has a reasonably high uh, carbon price and does in fact also use a dividend-like um, mechanism for returning funds to people, although 
in our study, we're, we're studying it partly because it's, it's not very transparent to people. So the way they get their money back is now through reduced healthcare premiums um, or taxes or something. And, and so we actually direct them to the website where they see how much money they got back in the last year and so on. And so probably that policy would be even more popular if it were more clear to people exactly why they were getting that money and if that money was more, more transparent. But I think in principle, carbon pricing can work and dividends can protect the living standards of, of the poor and less well-to-do, but we do need a high carbon price and a high dividend. So next question um, is, I'm interested in a national high voltage DC grid but I'm also interested in more distributed microgrids so that we aren't as reliant on the quote unquote big grid, which, which as we've seen in California could be disastrous during extreme weather events. Can you discuss the role of decentralized microgrid systems in the Green New Deal? I probably can't discuss it as well as, as the question writer. Um, I share the sort of interest in, in microgrids I think I think that in general we want we want a big grid that includes includes the the whole United States. I mean, I think from an engineering and cost sort of standpoint, that is essentially what we want to be able to build. But of course, I mean, I think to me, what California, um, my 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 read on what's happened in California is that their their public utility or the utility company, right, that owns and operates a grid has mismanaged it and underinvested in it and so on. And that's made it very, very unsafe, right? And it's caused some of the wildfires that, that we see today. Um, but I think that's all the more of a case for some, for some public investment in this good. Um, in general, I think being able to move energy around is going, it's gonna be much cheaper than everyone being able to be sustainable in smaller in smaller groups, right? So um, it's at least you wanna have that backup, I think. Of course, having a grid, um, does not mean that you don't want to have a lot of uh, decentralized energy and so on. You do, and in fact, that can help you deal with the the problem when when the grid breaks down in certain areas and so on. But I, I think a national grid makes a lot of sense from an economic and engineering perspective. But I'm I'm not an engineer. Awesome. Um, all right, next question. Uh, lots of great ideas, which I fully support, quote unquote. Um, but there. Are, are more rational, but they are more rational than humans are. What needs to change to make policy recommendations politically viable? What's going to happen to make those changes happen? Well, I think I mean, part of the reason that we wrote this report about the Green New Deal is it seemed to us like all of a sudden there was some new energy and political mobilization around doing something serious about climate. Um, and I think what the Green New Deal gets right that had been lost in some of our environmental policy is the importance of equity. I mean, we need, I didn't really stress it in the talk, but we stress it a little bit better in the paper and probably should do it even better than that. Um, that, for example, in the Green New Deal, like we need to make it clear to people that we're not gonna leave people behind, right? If you work for a dirty industry, right, in a fossil fuel sector, like those are absolutely the people who we need to be able to move and help transition towards, towards working in the green economy. So I think we need to put equity front and center. And I think if, you know, in the United States, a lot of people have very precarious lives economically. We're seeing that today in, in the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic. Um, I think we need to be able to tell people that, that we have their backs and this is something we're doing together. And by doing it together, it means that we're not gonna leave anyone behind. That, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's no reason that we should tolerate, you know, people who can work productively and effectively not working. Like all those people, we need all hands on deck. And so we need a series of policies, including public investments, that put those people to work in building a green, sustainable economy. I think that's one of the reasons that, that a Green New Deal polls better than a carbon tax, for example. I mean, a carbon tax is also presumably gonna lead to some of these same investments. That's what we call these things complementary policies. Right? If we had a high carbon price and no public investments, you would still see private investment in, well, even a little bit in, in grids, presumably, certainly in installing more wind power, solar power, and so on. Um, but I think the public investment, one important component is that in making sure that we're putting investment to places where people really need it. So 
places that are particularly fossil fuel dependent should be the places that we put up a lot of the solar panels and wind turbines and so on. All right, next question. Um, how would you modify your Green New Deal approach to scale it at the state level? That's a good question and something we've thought about a bit, uh, especially since it looks like that might be where we're stuck for to, to work for now. Um, it is, I think it's admittedly much more difficult to do at the state or local level than at the federal level because state and local governments have a much tighter um, spending limits, right, or, or, or borrowing options in the federal government. I mean, right now, right, the federal government can borrow money at less than 1% um, for, for a decade, right, which makes investments like this really a no-brainer for the federal government. For state and local governments, the rates are significantly higher. They have real borrowing constraints, which makes it difficult for them to do it. It's why we absolutely do need people in Washington leading this charge. Um, that said, some of the sort of policies we're talking about are things that could be done fairly fairly similarly at the local level, right? You could imagine, I mean, I think it will be localities, right, states or cities that, that move towards uh, banning um, fossil fuel infrastructure built in new housing developments, for example. That's something that doesn't really cost the government money per se, except maybe it slows down development a little bit in their, in their city or town. It's a sort of policy that might work a little bit better nationally, but isn't much more difficult to do at the local or state level. Um, oh, which of the other policies would work well at the state or local level? I mean, carbon pricing is something that could work at the state or local level. I think it's a little hard um, to dr have dramatically different prices for something like gasoline across counties because people can just go to the other county. Um, but it's something we could work on. I mean, one, one thing that's convinced me that we need sort of national leadership there is um, Boulder, for example, has a, has a, a carbon price on electricity, right? But it's exceedingly low, right? It has a cent, I mean, it has, has fairly little impact because I forget how many cents it is per kilowatt hour. I believe less than, I believe a lot less than one, right? So that's not going to have a huge impact. And, and I believe when that was passed, although you would all probably know better, well, you would, would know better than me, um, that there was opposition, I assume, arguing that, you know, businesses are going to move to the next county and so on. So some of these policies are more difficult. One policy that I would particularly like to push in, in Fort Collins um, would be the, the free mass transit. Just making mass transit something that anyone can hop on for no money. Because right now, our fares cover such a small fraction of the cost of running the mass transit. It wouldn't increase our costs by very much. And, and it's a sort of way that you can signal that, that, that we're really moving towards a green, a green future. So I think that's a relatively low-hanging fruit. And there are cities around the world that have adopted um, no fair mass transit. Uh, I think that sort of policy makes a lot of sense. Um, so there are certainly things that we should be testing out at the state and local level, but ultimately I do think we're going to need federal, federal leadership to, to do lots of the sort of investments that we truly need. All right, well, I, uh, I don't know what happened, but fortunately Anders was able to make it through the presentation. Apologies that we'll cut the Q&A a little short. Wanted to just say happy Earth Day. Appreciate you guys coming out on this awesome day of the year. Even if Anders can't hear me, I do want to thank him for a great presentation here tonight as well. But most importantly, thanks to you guys who are here tonight. It really does mean a lot to us to have such a wonderful group of you who want to continue to learn about renewable energy, even in these less than ideal and turbulent times. Thanks everyone.